Well, thank you very, very much. This really is an extraordinary honor, and I so deeply appreciate it. Les Blumgart is not only a friend, but as to all of us, uh, a mentor, a teacher, and a man uh, for whom our multiple specialties hold uh, so much uh, to be thankful for. Um, I've been asked to talk to you today about the Whipple procedure, um, obviously about the pancreas, which is the reason that Wes Les kindly didn't say very much about the pancreas. Um, I want to begin, uh, because there's so much to say very quickly, uh, and talk to you about how pancreatic surgery really began. The, the earliest experience uh, was resections of the tail of the pancreas, and that's not too surprising because one might reasonably imagine that that was the simpler uh, end of the pancreas to go to. The first operation that was recorded was in 1882, and it was done by Frederick Trendelenburg, a professor of surgery at Bonn. The story is that he took out a five-pound pancreatic sarcoma. We think that's almost certainly not true. Probably it was a left upper quadrant uh, sarcoma that, among other things, was involving the pancreas. Nevertheless, a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy was done. Um, I should note that the patient uh, died uh, two weeks or so after discharge from the hospital. And then over the next 20 or so years, 21 surgeons resected tail tumors in 24 patients, which obviously didn't provide a large experience for any single surgeon, at the most a couple of cases. And somewhat surprisingly, the mortality rate for what we would have thought today would be a pretty simple, straightforward procedure was still over 50%. Clearly, uh, the problems with tail resection uh, were small compared to resection of the head of the pancreas. Around this same time, though, the first pancreatic oduodenectomy was done, and it was done in 1898. It was done by an Italian surgeon by the name of Alessandro Cotavia, who lived into the 20th century. Uh, he was a professor of surgery in Bologna. This was a one-stage pancreatic resection uh, in ways quite similar to the way the operation is carried out today. The patient did not have biliary obstruction. Therefore, the patient had normal coagulation, and that's the reason it could be done as a one-stage procedure. Almost certainly, we today would not have done this resection in this patient because the patient apparently really had widespread disease, clearly incurable, and died in 24 days. So the first pancreatic oduodenectomy was done by Cotavia, but it was not a good outcome. Would you believe this man was an orthopedic surgeon? And he must have been an extraordinary surgeon. Uh, in 1898, when he did this operation, he was 37 years old. It was the same year in which, as Dr. Blumgart pointed out, uh, William Halstead locally excised an ampullary cancer, uh, and Whipple uh, was a 17-year-old high school student in Minnesota, a young man. There's no evidence that Cotavia performed any more pancreatic resections, whether this was because he was an orthopedic surgeon primarily and really didn't see that kind of patient or whether he was discouraged by the outcome, nobody really knows. But that was his operation. Um, here's a bust of Cotavia uh, in the Orthopedic Institute in Bologna, Italy, which is where he practiced for most of his professional life. And he really was a very, very well-known orthopedic surgeon, primarily uh, interested in and with significant contributions in fracture surgery. So he was a, a very accomplished gentleman. That's Cotavia. Let's move to the uh, next major player uh, in this arena, and that is Walter Kausch, a German surgeon who is generally credited for having performed the first two-stage uh, 
pancreaticoduodenectomy. And I put into quotation marks the three patients that uh, are said to have formed the sum of his experience for a reason which I'll get to in just a moment. Let me just pause for a second and, and talk to you uh, a little bit more about why two stages uh, were necessary in the jaundiced patients. Most patients in those days, as today, um, with periampulary tumors are jaundiced as a result of biliary obstruction, and the result particularly then, because these patients would often go undiagnosed and untreated for months before uh, they came to a, a physician. Major sur surgery was really impossible because of the impaired coagulation. Uh, there really was no knowledge about the need for bile to absorb fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, vitamin K had not even yet been described. And blood banking, uh, which would have been a critical uh, uh, function, in a patient who was about to undergo an operation associated with a significant chance for considerable blood loss, even if coagulation had been normal, um, what was still 30 years or more uh, in the future. Kausch uh, did his first stage of this two-stage operation with the goal of getting bile back into the intestinal tract and restoring uh, normal clotting. The second stage, which he did in this first patient, almost two months later, when coagulation was again normal, uh, involved resection of the head of the pancreas and part, but not all, of the duodenum. Apparently, this operation took about four hours to do. Uh, and he reconstructed with a gastrojejunostomy and a primary anastomosis of the remaining pancreas to that little bit of duodenum that he preserved. Patient survived the operation, recovered, went home, and died nine months later uh, of uh, apparently uh, overwhelming sepsis from cholangitis. Now, the reason I put the quotation marks around that three patients uh, that have been attributed to Kausch is because it's really inaccurate. The two other patients that he uh, began to care for died after he performed the first stage. So they never actually got through to the point where the resection of the cancer was done. Here's Walter Kausch with his operative team uh, he was 42 years old when he did this operation. He did it in Berlin, uh, where he was a professor of surgery, and uh, did it at uh, the August Victoria Hospital, which was a big city-county type uh, institution in that city. And to continue with our uh, progress in uh, Whipple's career, by this time he was a 28-year-old surgical intern, surgical resident at the Roosevelt Hospital in New York. So we'll move for, from Kausch, and we'll only give him credit now for one patient. We move to uh, really what is the, the beginning of the modern era in terms of pancreatic head resection with Alan Whipple uh, in 19. 35. Uh, that was the year that Alan Whipple first reported on his experience with the two-stage uh, pancreatic oduodenectomies, and eventually he ended up doing 11 of these two-stage resections. This is Professor Whipple. Uh, he was born in the late 1800s and lived well into the middle of the 20th century. Let me tell you a few things about this extraordinary man. He was born in Iran. His parents were missionaries uh, who were uh, working there. Uh, he spent the four first 14 years of his life in Iran, which undoubtedly accounts for uh, the fact that he became fluent in English and French and in, in a number of other uh, languages, as you see there. <clears throat> 
Uh, by the time he came back to the United States, his parents moved to Minnesota. Uh, I've already told you that he was a high school student there, and when he was ready for college, he went to Princeton University, and then eventually to Columbia, PNS, where he received his medical degree in 1908. He went on from that to the three-year residency in Roosevelt Hospital that I've already mentioned. And then when he was finished with his surgical training, he was appointed to the faculty uh, at Columbia. And in 10 short years, uh, was a full professor and named surgeon in chief at Presbyterian Hospital. Must have been an extraordinarily talented man to have advanced so quickly. This uh, is a history that was actually uh, published in one of Whipple's articles of his accounting of the first three operations that he did. So the first one uh, as a two-stage procedure was done in 1934, and I would point out to you that at the first stage, uh, he used the duodenum and astomosing the bile duct to the duodenum in order to get bile back into the GI tract. And that the second stage uh, was done not only by resecting the ampulla, that was the site of the cancer and the adjacent head of the pancreas, but with an anastomosis of the pancreas to the remaining uh, duodenum. This did not... Um, go well, and the patient died on the first post-operative day from uh, leakage of the pancreatico-duodenal anastomosis. Uh, this made, as you might imagine, an enormous impression on the professor and his subsequent operations for actually a number of years uh, were done without a pancreatic uh, anastomosis without a pancreatic ojejunostomy or duodenostomy, uh, but rather with closure of the pancreatic stump. So he just tied off the pancreatic duct. The reason for that leakage, uh, as he determined from an autopsy in that first patient, was the fact that because he had used cat gut sutures, the anastomosis just broke apart. And so very, very quickly, this patient had a complete separation of that anastomosis. It wasn't until a number of years later uh, from work in the experimental laboratory that he and his colleagues realized that silk ought to be used for the anastomosis. And eventually, of course, that was done. The outcome in the second two patients was considerably better. The patients did reasonably well, were discharged from the hospital. This Second patient died eight months later, again of cholangitis, secondary to uh, cholecystogastrostomy, which was the way he got bile back into the GI tract. The third patient did even better, eventually dying from metastatic disease, but more than two years after the operation. So they did, did reasonably well after that first unfortunate uh, outcome. These are illustrations from one of Whipple's early articles that show the elements of that two-stage resection. This is the first stage, and Whipple performed a gastrojejunostomy, uh, which could be done safely without significant blood loss. He then ligated the bile duct and uh, performed a cholecystogastrostomy to decompress the obstructed biliary tree. At the uh, second stage of the operation, which was done a couple of months or so later uh, when coagulation had been restored, uh, was to first remove most but not all of the duodenum and a, a take a V-shaped excision out of the head of the pancreas, uh, over sew the pancreas, uh, and then drain uh, the area well. Uh, the likelihood of a pancreatic fistula developing was high. He realized that. And so uh, drainage was an important part of that operation. I should mention as well, although it's not widely known or talked about, that around that time, uh, both in Europe and in the United States, uh, 
it was felt that the duodenum, or at least part of the duodenum, was absolutely critical for survival in a human being. And that's the reason that uh, even though many of these resections involve a portion of the duodenum being removed, you'll note that in virtually every one, even a little bit of it uh, is felt uh, to be uh, adequate but necessary for survival. Obviously, that is not true. So how do we go from the two-stage pancreatic resection of the head of the gland uh, to a one-stage, which is obviously what we do today? It really involves a variety of advances in other fields, uh, many of which have already been referred to uh, in the area of biliary surgery by Dr. Blumgart. Uh, it has to do with the discovery uh, and our understanding of blood grouping, both the ABO groups as well as eventually some years later the RH blood group system. It has to do with the creation of blood banks, which really didn't occur until the latter part of the 1930s, even before these operations were being done, uh, established in this country and uh, in Europe. And in addition to that, uh, the eventual discovery of vitamin K, which at the time these operations were being done uh, as two stages, uh, was not even uh, known or understood. It was in 1935 that vitamin K was isolated as the coagulation factor, spelled with a K, in, in German, which is why vitamin K is called vitamin K instead of, what would it be, vitamin F, I suppose. Uh, vitamin K uh, was uh, not absorbed in patients with obstructive jaundice. Um, and it was Henrik Dam, a, a British, or rather a Danish biochemist who discovered that. Uh, he was working in Freiburg, Germany at the time. And then eventually in 1939, when Edward Doisy, another uh, biochemist working at St. Louis University, elucidated the structure of vitamin K and then eventually synthesized it. And it was in 1943 that both of these men uh, won the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine as a result of the significance of this, uh, this discovery, these discoveries. So, Blood banking and the availability of vitamin K really were the two things that made a one-stage pancreatic duodenectomy possible. And this is from another one of Whipple's articles in which he has sketched the, uh, the elements of this one-stage resection, uh, distal gastrectomy, removing and that's meant to show most, but not all, of the duodenum being removed um, and reconstruction as you see there. I would point out that peeking out from uh, behind the duodenum, or rather the jejunum, uh, over here is still the pancreas, which has been uh, closed, tied off, but not reconnected to the gut. Now, th there's a very interesting uh, little anecdote which I'll tell you about this first one-stage resection that I must admit until I prepared the material for this talk, I didn't know. Uh, it is that then, as now, there were a number of surgeons who had come over from another country. These were, I think, a, a number of countries in Europe and they were touring various centers in the United States to see this or that surgeon do his operation, uh, which uh, they were trying to learn from. And on this particular day, a dozen or so visiting European surgeons came to see Whipple perform a gastrectomy. Uh, Whipple had a patient all lined up who had been worked up well preoperatively and was felt to have a, an antral tumor. So the professor was in the operating room, the patient was asleep, they made the incision, uh, 
and all of the surgeons were gathered around the table watching interest, with interest. Um, Whipple transected the stomach. He really didn't explore very much, but his, his, his uh, initial explorations showed uh, findings that were perfectly consistent with what he thought the patient had. He transected the stomach, reflected the stomach over to the patient's right, and it was only at that moment for the first time that they saw in the lesser sac the head of the pancreas, which had a mass in it. And I'm not sure what went through his mind at that time. I can imagine, but I won't say it. The pancreatic head was mobile. The patient was not jaundiced, so there was no question about whether there would be a problem with coagulation. The stomach was already transected, so Whipple needed to think quickly about what it was that he would do in order to deal uh, with these findings. So what did Whipple do? Whipple did a Whipple. Uh, and that was the first one-stage Whipple operation that was done. Um, there's no uh, recording of what the visiting surgeons thought, uh, but if they had uh, been very perceptive, they probably would have come to the conclusion that they just saw a major piece of surgical history uh, unfolding before their eyes. So that's the story of that first uh, one-stage uh, Whipple operation. Um, in 1940, when that happened, uh, Whipple clearly realized that this was the way to do it, uh, that patients didn't need to be uh, uh, bypassed in order to get coagulation uh, back to normal. And so the operations that he did subsequent to that uh, were all one-stage procedures, and as you can see, he did uh, some 26 uh, additional patients uh, during the rest of his career. Um, in total, it's interesting to realize that he probably did no more than 40 or so what we would term today Whipple resections, and disturbingly, the, the mortality rate uh, at that time was really quite high, about 35% in his uh, patient group. With the introduction of the one-stage procedure and vitamin K and blood banking and so forth, the experience began very, very quickly to uh, explode around the United States and in Europe and I'm sure in other centers all over the world so that uh, from the, from the early 40s and through the 1970s, when increasing numbers of these operations were being done, uh, more and more experience was being uh, gathered, but the morbidity and the mortality rates, as we all know, remain quite high. It's interesting to look back at some of the studies reported in the literature and realize that although today we talk about centers of excellence, and the uh, better outcomes that are achieved when operations of this complexity are done in centers of excellence. There's some evidence, even as you look at those data, that concentration of experience in one center or with one or two people at a center uh, really does make a big difference in outcome. This is one of uh, the centers and by surgeons who have already been uh, referred to in, by Professor Blumgart in his lecture. Uh, at the Leahy Clinic, Ken Warren and, and Cattell uh, clearly developed an interest in the management of pancreatic cancer and other pancreatic diseases. And they were able to put together uh, their experience over a roughly 20-year period from 1942 to 1961 with over 200 Whipple operations uh, and an operative mortality rate of about 12%, much lower than it had been in earlier years and certainly in Whipple's and other uh, surgeons' hands, but still higher than it is today or should be. This is another gentleman who's... Uh, whose face and, and demeanor uh, and contributions are known to many of us in this room, John Howard, who uh, 
uh, sadly passed away a couple of years ago now. But John Howard was an example of an extraordinarily talented, um, skilled technical surgeon, a good physician who, with an interest in pancreatic diseases, was able to uh, operate and achieve a very, very low mortality rate in his own experience. He wrote a few years ago, uh, and he's referring to his own practice in this quotation. He says, in 1968, I had reported a series of 41 consecutive Whipple operations uh, without an intervening operative death, a series subsequently extended to 72. So here's a man who, even in the late 60s, early 70s, was able to achieve really quite remarkable results. And of course, we all know that today the operative mortality rate is less than 5%, and in fact, it's less than 1% in many centers. Well, I want to talk a little bit to you about the reasons why the operation is so much safer today, even though the elements of it are basically the same, and the morbidity rate, the complication rate, and many of the complications are very similar to what they used to be. Uh, again, as I was preparing this lecture, I went back to a chapter that I had written on, on pancreatic diseases, and I went to the area where I was talking about pancreatic cancer, and in the diagnosis section, I found this radiograph. And I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with this sign, but this is what has been called the Frostberg's inverted three sign. And when I wrote that chapter, I wrote something like, this is the classic diagnostic sign of pancreatic cancer. And that was the case well into the 1970s. There's the inverted three. And obviously, it comes from a, from a large mass in the head of the pancreas, which tethers and pulls and distorts the duodenum around it. That was the way the diagnosis was made in many of these patients. And because the diagnosis was made late, uh, and because we really had no way preoperatively of accurately staging these patients, so many of the patients who came to the operating room and who actually had Whipple resections should not have been resected. In fact, only about 15% of the patients we operated upon were truly resectable according to the criteria that we would use today. Why is the operation safer? Well, CT scanning, again, which has already been uh, mentioned in the previous lecture, is an enormous contribution to what it is that we do. Um, you may uh, not realize it, but it wasn't until the very late uh, 19, uh, very early 1970s, late in the year 1971, that the first clinical CT scan was carried out on the EMI scanner in London, England. And it really wasn't until four years or so after that that the first body scan was carried out in this country, um, in the Mallinckrodt Institute in St. Louis. I think it's interesting, and that's the reason that I put it up on this uh, slide. This is one of the very, very first published CT images. It's an image that had to be traced in order to make any sense out of it at all, because if you looked at the original CT image, it would be really very, very vague. But this may very well be the first uh, uh, picture of the pancreas uh, on a CT imaging. There it is there, and although it's the pig, it is the pancreas. So we go from this kind of imaging, which is the inverted three sign for diagnosis, to what we're all accustomed to today. And, and who could ever have imagined at that time that uh, this sort of image uh, would show us not only the uh, tumor itself in the head of the pancreas, but in this particular 
uh, image that I chose, the fact that this is locally advanced disease with uh, likely involvement of the superior mesenteric vein. I think uh, in addition to earlier diagnosis and better staging that comes, that came from the CT, that uh, almost certainly, although it's more difficult to prove, that patients were being operated upon really in much better preoperative condition, better nutrition and so forth. Uh, if you think about the fact that in those early years, the average weight loss that these patients uh, would have experienced by the time they came to an operation was 25 pounds, many more than that, uh, that the symptoms, often the uh, jaundice was present uh, for many months and so forth, uh, clearly that was improved upon uh, in more recent years with better and earlier diagnosis. So I've talked a little bit already about the earlier diagnosis the CT scans provided. CT scan also has made an enormous impact uh, on the diagnosis and the treatment of complications of the Whipple operation. Uh, I don't know how many uh, realize it, but when we did Whipple operations into the, uh, well into the 1970s, patients recovering from the operation uh, would become uh, febrile, they would get a very high white count, uh, they would obviously be septic, and we wondered why, we certainly had a suspicion of why, but in order to prove what the diagnosis was, whether it was a pancreatic fistula, whether it was a, whether it was a pancreatic abscess and so forth, we needed to reoperate on these people. It was the only way you could really figure out what was going on. And almost always, for understandable reasons, reluctant to take the patient back to the operating room, we were later than we should have been. And we found infection, we found uh, pancreatic juice digesting the tissues, bleeding was often accompaniment of, of the problem, and obviously uh, the mortality rates under those circumstances were very, very high. So in the late 70s, um, CTs having advanced very, very quickly in terms of their ability to, to diagnose these uh, complications. Here's a picture, a diagnosis of an abscess following the pancreatic ostomy. Here's uh, not only the diagnosis, but the treatment of the abscess, which became more and more common in the latter part of the 1970s. Um, and in addition, uh, other advances in radiographic techniques uh, also played a very major role in decreasing the complications. Uh, the last one that I want to talk about specifically is angiography, uh, both for the diagnosis and then eventually the control of bleeding. And this was uh, a technology and techniques that uh, were developed and, and advanced in the early 1970s and into the latter part of that decade. Uh, here is an example of one of the very first uh, articles that dealt with selective angiography and embolization. That happened in the early 70s. Uh, the uh, later uh, introduction of uh, stenting to occlude the bleeding site uh, happened uh, some years after that. But without a question, those uh, approaches really uh, made the operation much safer. Well. There really aren't very many things that have changed in a substantial way from the original operations that I've reviewed with you that the Italian and the German and then eventually the American surgeons did. But the one that I thought I would mention uh, is the pylorus preserving operation. Most people attribute that uh, variation on the standard Whipple to doctors Bill Traverso, Traverso and William Longmire, both at UCLA. But the fact of the matter is, uh, although I would like to um, uh, claim it as a UCLA contribution, uh, 
The fact is that the first of these so-called pylorus preserving operations was done by a British surgeon in 1944. Kenneth Watson did a pylorus preserving operation in a patient who had ampullary cancer. Apparently, although he did publish on it, uh, he never did another one, and one is not quite certain why that's so. Uh, in addition, Marty Atson at the Mayo Clinic in 1975, before the uh, Traverso and Longmire did theirs uh, a couple of years later, uh, did a couple of cases. He, as I say, he didn't report it, so he, he wasn't given credit for it, but nevertheless should be. And then uh, Traverso and Longmire actually operated on a couple of patients with chronic pancreatitis, who they reported upon uh, in an article in 1978. I talked with Dr. Longmire some years ago. I said, why did you do that? What was your motivation? He said, well, he wanted to try to decrease marginal ulceration, which was another longer term uh, problem uh, with some of the Whipple operations that had been done early on. Uh, and, and also, he said, improve nutrition by preserving the entire stomach. It's interesting that, uh, although some people will disagree with my comment, I think there really are no convincing data uh, that it really does provide significantly better nutrition or offer any other real advantage um, over the standard Whipple operation, which removes the antrum. But without a question, it is the most widely performed variation of the Whipple worldwide, and I think uh, clearly it's become my standard operation to do. Well, I want to end with uh, three or so slides that... Um, say a little bit more about uh, Alan Whipple, the man. Uh, Whipple was, among many other things, a member of the editorial board of the Annals of Surgery. And this is uh, uh, taken from the tribute to him, which was published in the Annals shortly after he died. And I'll, I'll read some of the material that I put up there. Dr. Alan Oldfather Whipple, a distinguished member of the editorial board of the Annals of Surgery, died April 16, 1963, at the age of 82. Apart from his contributions to disorders of the pancreas, Whipple was an authority on literature and ancient cultures and was especially interested in the Orient and in medical history. During his student time at Princeton, he excelled tutoring classmates in Latin, taking elective courses in Arabic. Towards the end of his life, Whipple returned to the Middle East, this time as a medical historian. So you see, this was really a Renaissance man, and although we speak of him in terms of his contributions to pancreatic disease and pancreatic surgery, there was much more depth to him than that. He goes on, uh, he is an eponym for a set of diagnostic signs of pancreatic islet cell adenoma. He's referring, of course, to Whipple's triad. And for a boldly conceived operation, radical pancreatectomy, which will assure that his name will be used for a long time. He was a truly kindly man, benevolent, modest, and great-hearted. Physically, he gave the appearance of frailty, but he was of tush, tough, lasting fiber. His mind and his eyes seemed to sparkle more as he grew older. He leaves a host of students and colleagues sad, and this was written by John Mulholland, who was the chairman of the editorial board at the time. I'll end with these, uh, these comments. Um, quote, but for all of his contributions, his name will forever be linked with the most technically challenging and demanding of all abdominal operations. And few of us who perform the operation will ever forget that day when we were able to say with pride and deep satisfaction, today I did my first Whipple. <laughs> and I think I'll end at that point. I want to thank you very, very much for this. <laughs>